Hello everyone, this is What Your Pastor Didn't Tell You. Today I have Dr. Joel Koretko on. We're going to be talking about the James White and Leighton Flowers debate on John 6, where they were supposedly arguing whether unlimited or limited atonement, at least, is, is being taught in the passage. How are you doing today, Dr. Koretko? Hey, Zach. Doing uh, really well, thanks. Yeah. All right. Awesome. So for those that are not familiar with uh, Dr. Koretko here, uh, he is a ex-Calvinist, 10 years, I believe, and he also is a biblical scholar. So I figured he'd be the perfect person to talk about this debate and uh, give a good a little analysis and talk about all the little Greek intricacies and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, let's go over first thoughts. Uh, what were your first thoughts on, on just the, the conversation, the debate in general? Yeah, I mean, going into it, and I'll just kind of give everybody a bit of a background with me. So like like you said, I was a Calvinist for, I'd say, over 10 years, uh, becoming a Christian in my uh, late teens. And then, yeah, for quite a while, uh, held to that view and really loved all the theologians and uh, the different exegetical ways of looking at certain texts in that perspective and was convinced by them. I'm very much a text person. Like you said, I'm a biblical scholar. So, uh, I, it's all about text for me. Um, not not a theologian by training or anything like that. Um, very much biblical studies. And so, yeah, uh, I'm interested in this. Uh, if I'm going to be honest with you, it's not something I look into that much anymore in the sense of I'm not trying to figure out my views on on this really for the majority of texts. Uh, and why I was interested in this debate, I, I, and I wouldn't normally watch a debate between uh, James White and Leighton Flowers or really anyone on, on the subject is because it was John 6. And I think John 6 is just a really interesting text. And it's one of the ones... And I don't want to like shoot myself in the foot here, but the one of the ones that I've probably spent the least amount of time exegeting. And so like I've spent time there, but it's like, okay, this would be really cool to uh, hear some people who have thought really hard about this text and see maybe I can get some different perspectives on it because I have my opinions on Ephesians 1, Romans 9, all these texts. Um, and I have one on this as well, but it'd be cool, I thought, to, to learn a bunch more um, from two people who have spent a lot of time researching it. Uh, and then so going into it and without kind of putting everything uh, at the front here, I was I was probably a little bit dissatisfied with the with the debate in overall. I felt like it really kind of went in very different directions a lot of the time and didn't really focus in on the arguments at hand. Uh, and to to the credit and discredit of of both. And it's very hard to debate, so I'm not gonna sit here in my chair uh, without the pressure of a crowd and all that. Um, so I, I get that, that that that's tough. But yeah, it was it, it was all right. Um, yeah, I, I I wish it would have been a little bit more about John six, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I heard a lot of people saying that the the debate, you know, whether it's, you know, I guess, you know, James White is saying, hey, this this passage proves unconditional election. And then Leighton Flowers is like, I know it doesn't. And um, I thought it was a kind of weird approach from James White, because I, I don't think he ever even like described like what his specific view of unconditional election is. Maybe he kind of just assumed that everybody knows what it is. But then I never understood how he got from like his position to unconditional election is true. So just mm -hmm. for for specificity here, uh, unconditional election is. Uh, yeah, that's right. Oh, I need to pull. I messed up my screen. Sorry. Just right, want to so... make sure I get the view right. All right. Uh, so unconditional election is a Calvinist doctrine relating to predestination that describes the actions and motives of God prior to his creation of the world. When he predestined some people to receive salvation, the elect, and the rest he left to continue in their sins and receive the just punishment, eternal damnation for their transgressions of God's law as outlined in the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. So that's a <clears throat> general idea of it, but like like maybe some parts of it were, um, you know, certainly you could say, yep, yeah, like, you know, if you take White's view, that provides evidence for his position of, of, of unconditional election at the same time. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I never saw how he, they, they breached scraps the, he breached the, the gap of his view to that specific doctrine. So maybe we can get some comments on that in the, in the chat of what, what we missed on that. If you agree with that, of course, and mm -hmm. um, as far as the biblical stuff, I thought it was really interesting, their views. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts, though. Um, and 
like there was a lot of really interesting things said that we're going to get into um some good things bad things on both sides uh, but yeah um anything else to add about all that just that yeah there was it was kind of like the element of irresistible grace in it too right because that's another part a part yeah, of tulip true. yeah that yeah. the father draws and if the father draws you you will come like it's a, really a lot about that as well yeah um, and so it's kind of like this in between between the two but not really talking about that um yeah, it was, it was kind of a bit all over the place. Yeah, yeah, that is really interesting. Good point there. So the, the, the passage. All right. Can you give us just a really one minute quick overview of the actual topic, like what the passage of John 6? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of passages that are kind of interconnected here. John okay. 6 is a long dialogue, uh, but it kind of circles around uh verse 44 and then verse 45 in this particular debate and rightly so though you do need to consider the wider context th those verses being no one is able to come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and i will raise him up in the last day it is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by god everyone who hears from the father and learns comes to me and so that's 44 and 45 of chapter 6 and so kind of the debate is, okay, no one's able to come to the father unless the father draws them. So is that, is there like volition on their part? Is there no volition on their part? Uh, who does God draw under what conditions? And so that's kind of the, the debate that's going to be going on between flowers and white. Um, are there conditions for God drawing? Um, can you find that in the text? Do you have to import that from elsewhere? Um, do you have to bring a biblical or a systematic theology to these verses to understand them? Can the verses in and of themselves give evidence towards one uh, view or the other when it comes to whether or not there's uh, volition on the part of the believer in this? Right. Yeah. And so they, they kind of go back and forth on that. Yeah, it's a really interesting point because, uh, you know, a lot of people hate on Leighton Flowers for citing all these other verses, which is like totally fine, you know, if they're evidence for his position at the same time. Um, like. Like, I'm, and I'm also totally fine with saying, hey, the text is ambiguous. Maybe we do need to look at these other passages to give us a better idea of what they're talking about. Um, but at the same time, like, um, I am interested to see, like, how you go about that, like, methodologically speaking, um, from your perspective. Mm -hmm. So uh, specific uh, clips. Let's dive into it. Sure. Yeah. All right. So let me know if you can hear. Of course, everyone in the comments, let me know if uh, we need to turn our mics up or something like that. You got to discuss them, the topic. <laughs> what did you say? I was just going to say, I was going to joke. You got th three, four million watching right now? Oh, yes, yes. Three and a half, <laughs> three and a half people. Uh, so actually, so the uh, first thing we're talking about here is uh, why it makes a really interesting point. I wanted to get your thoughts on. ...of the debate does... John 644 teach unconditional election obviously is simply stating has the historical understanding of John chapter 6 since the Reformation is that a proper reading of the text and I submit to you right now the only way to judge this debate is to judge on the basis of whether there is consistency in handling the Word of God all right so what stood out to you there yeah, I mean, it's a it's really strange, I, I find, um, because, I mean, there's two things. He's talking about consistency in hermeneutics and in right. his interpretation, which I think everyone's going to say, yeah. But then he says the historical interpretation since the Reformation, which is, that's just very strange to me, um, because the Reformation is very recent in Christian history. And my basically, when I heard that, I went, so what? Who, who, why does anyone care? since the reformation i understand protestantism i understand there's a tradition yeah. but he's he's the one saying he doesn't want to be relying on tradition and wants to be just exegeting the text right but yet he's saying that somehow the reformation is some sort of um buttress of authority uh in interpretation or somehow more right than those who might have come earlier so uh yeah that was that was really strange to me um it does kind of show how indebted he is to a particular theological tradition um, I think his cards are pretty well shown there. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that will become also a bit uh, more apparent as we move along. But yeah, I found that to be a very strange way to open a debate about what's supposed to be just <laughs> yeah. what the text means from 2000 years ago, because you skipped right. um, 1500 years. Right. No, it's like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we've been reading it this way for 100 years. Like, that's the equivalent of it. It's like, 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, right on. <laughs> All righty. Uh, so let's get good there. All right, 11 of four. So they, of course, they go through our, their presentations here. This is part of it. Let's see. They are the people who present tense participles are looking upon the Son and believing in Him and receiving eternal life. Well, the Jews grumble about this. Uh, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? And Jesus answers yeah, in verse 43. Yeah. All right. Yeah, um, I noted this to you when we were talking before. Uh, so we'll, I'm going to mention this now, and then I'll mention it again later on when okay. it becomes apparent again, which is... Uh, James brings Greek into this debate a lot. Uh, I don't doubt that James can read the New Testament to some degree in Greek. Um, I want to be really kind when I say this, but it is quite apparent that James appears to have a rather superficial knowledge of how language works or as particularly how Greek works because okay. he mentions things and he'll say things. And here he talks about the present tense participles uh, of looking on the sun and believing in him. And so he's, he's noting the grammatical forms. Uh, he doesn't really give you uh, what he's trying to mean by that. He's saying things about grammar. Um, and, I, and he's not, he's never quite uh, clear exactly his exegetical point he's making. And he's going to do this again at the end, but he he's reading a lot into what into the into just basic forms of Greek. Um, a participle doesn't really mean much in and of itself. And you can say things in multiple ways in Greek and mean the exact same thing. So unless you're going to explain what you mean by why a present tense participle is important here, uh, I don't know who you're signaling speaking to. Um, are you just trying to signal that somehow you have this? You, you know the Greek, and there's some hidden meaning in the Greek or something like that. Um, yeah, and so I'm going to stop on this one because he actually brings this up again right near the end. And it's it's pretty problematic because uh, he, he critiques Leighton saying that Leighton's exegesis is faulty because he didn't realize there were present tense participles and not finite verbs. And anyone who knows Greek can, can read it. And so you didn't really introduce me that much, but I read Greek. So I'm a Septuagint scholar kind of by trade. Uh, and among other things that I work in. Um, and so I read a lot of Greek all the time. And so if someone said that, I'm kind of getting ahead of the game here. Uh, so we maybe can cover it a little less later. Uh, if someone says there's the, a huge exegetical weight that's between a participle, like I'm walking and a finite verb, he walks, um, that that almost never would happen in language. And especially in Greek, that there's somehow an argument fall apart based on that. And so James doesn't explain it later on, nor here, what he means by citing Greek grammar and citing the forms of these things. Okay. But if you know Greek, you're going to go, how could that be relevant beyond just the most minute thing? Um, and even probably not then. And mm -hmm. so without getting any more into it, yeah. uh, I'll leave that there. But it's a tell to me that like I don't think you know what you're trying to claim or this is just a, a, a sign to people that, that I know Greek or something like that when really you're not saying anything of substance and that argument wouldn't make sense, whatever your argument is. It's just too minute of a point. Do you actually understand how, how language works, how you can communicate things in multiple ways and mean the same thing, and that exegesis usually doesn't, almost never um, bends or and breaks upon a participle or a finite verb or something like that. Interesting. That was a long okay. rant there. Uh, yeah. I, for some people, might that, that might have been a bit, a bit over their heads, but uh, it's going to be a consistent thing here. Okay, so uh, we got a commenter. He's, a, he's also a YouTuber. Uh, good guy. So uh, he says, uh, White's point about the participle was in response to people who said that it's not passive because it's not in a, uh, I guess, masculine plural voice, which is middle passive true. voice. Oh, okay. Uh, which is trivially, trivially true to anyone who knows Greek. Um, and he has another comment on it, but does that make sense to uh, why he would say that? No, I don't think that's what, in the debate itself, I did not see that. Um, I didn't see anyone ask anything about the middle passive. 
um, middle or passive. Um, yeah, so yeah. I don't so this remember that being statement. the case. So, <clears throat> yeah, um, maybe he's responding to people that, um, you know, have, like have used that as an argument in the past kind of thing. Hmm. Um, yeah, if that's the case, that still doesn't matter. Um, if it the difference between an active and a passive, um, I like the uh, the voice of the verb. Um, it it doesn't uh, it doesn't matter necessarily if I say uh, so. So I can use an active verb and not have any like if, if we're talking about volition here. I, I think that's what they're getting at. I'm not quite sure with this comment. Is that uh, without getting them to answer it? Like you could use an active verb like he receives a punch to the face. Um, so that's an active verb, receive, and he's receiving a punch to the face. There's no like volition or anything, despite it being an active mm -hmm. verb. So I'm not sure if that's what he's responding to. The mid middle passive active, it doesn't matter. That 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 that's just that's so rudimentary to to language. Anyways, we should we should move beyond the the language nitpicking stuff. Okay. Um. He also said this. Let me know if this changed any things. Uh, he didn't say it was passive because it was a parcel, but that it could still be as a parcel, just despite not being in a uh passive voice that's all uh he's well it wouldn't be that it is passive but rather he's saying he'd be saying that the the action being described the semantics not the grammar of it but the semantics like what does it mean he the, the meaning would be uh something passively happening to somebody that's what he I, he does say that and we'll get there i think we are gonna we're gonna talk about that okay all right yeah yeah yeah, uh, Tyler, the free thinker, was just saying that, hey, he's responding to objections in advance, I guess. All right. Okay. So let's see here. Next we have... Actually, the next point, I think, is this very point. Okay, so play it. Yeah, go for it. And says, do not grumble amongst yourselves. No one is able to come to me unless the... He's just going to let me sit here. Pardon me? No, uh, no, I was I was playing it, and obviously you can't hear it or see it. Oh, in verse I forty-three, could hear it. Uh, oh, is this okay. not Jesus, the son of Joseph? And Jesus answers in verse forty-three and says, "Do not grumble amongst yourselves. No one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him." and I will raise him up on the last day. Please note, once again, the verse ends with the same phraseology that we saw up above. In verse 39, when Jesus expresses what the Father's will for him is, he says, at the end, I'm not going to lose any of those, but instead, I will raise it up at the last day. Here in verse 44, no one has the ability to come to Jesus unless the Father, the one who sent me, draws him, and I will raise him on the last day. It's very important to note that when it says the Father draws him, this is the same him in the last phrase, and I will raise him on the last day. There is no contradiction. You don't have the, the father drawing some people and the son not raising him up at the last day. It is the same him. If we're going to, many of the ways around this text try to insert a break in verse 44 to where you have people who are drawn by the father, but then they have to do something. They have their free will actions or whatever else it might be, and those who are raised up at the last day become a different group. You cannot do that with the language. He who is raised up by the Son is the same one who is effectively drawn by the Father. But please note the direct assertion of the text. No one has the ability to come to me. What does that mean? Do we believe these words? Remember, this is in explanation. Back at verse 36, you've seen me, but you don't believe. All right, maybe let's stop it there. No one. Maybe we, uh, I'm one of us might have had the wrong timestamp or something there. Because <laughs> oh uh, he's, yeah, yeah. right. Because uh, he, he's about to, he's, at, he's on the previous verse. So, uh, or yeah, that um, from what okay, so we were yeah, talking about. Anything to respond to there? Uh, well, not really, because I mean, he's just, basically reading the verse okay. uh yeah 
right, and he's so. about to go into um I don't know if we want to keep playing uh yep. but he's going to talk about the 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 uh, those who have listened and learned listened from the father and and learned uh and talk about those as uh passive actions I, I think that might be coming do you want to do you want to try and hit it just so that we can show that oh, that's okay. what he says yeah I see all right the action of God in teaching. It's not that he's just throwing it out there and then they will accept or not accept or whatever else. No, they are the passive recipients of the teaching of God. And then that's also described in the one hearing passive action. You are something is coming to you from outside. Yeah, there you the go. one hearing yeah. from the father and learning. Yep. Yeah. And so this is getting, I think, into what was being said as well by the perhaps by the person in the comments there. And so this is this is also really interesting um, because th that is a pretty big assumption. And I think Leighton points this out rightly. Like, what, wait a second. You're saying that listening and learning are somehow um, passive actions. There's nothing inherent in these verbs um, that would indicate passivity. So uh, you could you could say that someone... Um, like however you want to use it, this verb uh, akuo in Greek, it, it could be, be many different contexts. Um, you could you could think um, like even just like in, in English, if you were to go like, "Hey, was he? Uh, did you listen? Uh, or did you pay attention in the lecture?" Oh, um, I listened, but I was on my computer. And so, like the the word "listen" there, like what it's conveying, um, could it it the idea would be. Like the words came in, but you weren't actually like paying attention. Like it's, it's that it's flexible, right? But whereas in another instance, say, hey, did you listen to the lecture? Yeah, I listened. As in like I paid close attention and was taking it in. Like it's just it's a very flexible word in that way. So um, there's nothing inherent in Akuo um, that it's somehow passive. It would really depend on uh, context. Uh, and that that's kind of the main thing here is like what is the context and what and what, what what is it paired with? And so we've got here akuo paired with uh, manthano, and manthano is is the word for learning. So the one who hears from the father and learns. Uh, manthano is related to uh, it's the verbal form uh, for mathetes, disciple. So like discipling, learning. A disciple is a learner, and so it's uh, th these two words are being paired together here. Um, I, I was I was interested in this because I heard that and I went okay. What if we what if we go with James here? Uh, what if we say, oh, what if the, these are passive activities? Um, and uh, maybe that's like he's he's got some sort of nuance of the Greek that um, we're missing or I'm missing or something like that. And then I just went, OK, I'm going to do basic step number one. Step number one in any um, study of the New Testament of words, you're just going to open up a lexicon, uh, a dictionary, essentially. Right. And so I did. I just opened up the typical uh, lex uh, lexicon, which is uh, BDAG. And uh, I, I went and I started reading through on Akuo. And, and I just realized, and I went down and one of the very first entries, it, uh, it actually cites from Polybius, so a contemporary, like near to the New, to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And one of the examples is, um, it uses Akuo uh, and Manthano with each other and says that, Hearing is not the same as learning, as though learning is actually um, more of like uh, takes more effort, and is, is, is there's there's something required on the part of the the the, the person. So it's not just pa it's not passive. Like it actually contrasts hearing and then having to learn. I'll I'll read it to you here. This is from Polybius, the Histories, Book Three, and it's at the end here. So just follow with me for a sec so you can get the context. <laughs> so it says all this can be recognized and understood from general history, but not at all from the historians of the wars themselves, such as the war with the with Perseus or that with Philip, unless indeed anyone reading their descriptions of the battles alone conceives that he has acquired an adequate knowledge of the management and nature of the whole war. Now listen, this, however, is not at all so, and I consider that my history differs to its advantage as much from the works on particular episodes as learning does from listening. <laughs> and so you see, like, even in like the in common Greek speech, and of course, you don't want to say like this is across the board, but this person is saying, uh, learning is very different from listening. You, like it's, there's an engagement. There's there's a very there's 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 more to it, and so they're not they're not the same thing. And this is just again, this is superficial. I just went to the to B Dag and went, oh, hey, like the, uh, that's a really big claim to say that somehow learning is just this completely passive thing. When 
in the cultural world around the text, uh, you've got people saying that learning is very different from listening. Uh, so much, so much so that you can just use it in an analogy. And so, yeah, again, White would need to back up his presupposition here. Why is he saying that? You can't just say that. You need to like, is that a part of the cognitive world of of the Greeks of the Greek speakers at the time? Um, would these just be understood as passive things? On what basis would you say that? Like, that's the first steps we need to take here. Um, and do you have evidence for that? Um, but he just, it's just an assertion, right? And even just a, like a basic look at BDAG would go, oh, um, other people are distinguishing these things. Uh, so mm-hmm. does that make sense? Yeah, so just for some clarity. So in this passage, the, <clears throat> the, the specific passage is saying, um, you know, Jesus is saying, uh, no one, ca- no one has, or that's not the right passage. All right, where am I at? All right, yep, it is written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from Him comes to Me. So basically, that 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 hearing and learning, those are the two words that we're we're questioning, right, to see if they're the same thing. Yeah, or both for passive. Yeah, both passive yeah, both things passive. that are for just an intake. You're just sitting there, yeah, intaking. Yeah. Which so, but it, it's basically in this in this question. Um, the for the importance for this discussion is James White is saying, hey, for I guess, you know, when we're saved or whatever, however that works, when we when we get Christ, um, <clears throat> the that Jesus is quoting, he's saying, hey, they will all be taught by God. And and, you know, so it's just, you know, simply teaching. But not only that, um, everyone who has heard the father and learned from him comes to me. So basically saying, hey, um, not only is it, they're just, you know, basic learning like we would think of, it is specifically like uh, it's a passive thing, like they like they don't have control over it, basically. Is, is that is that how we're Yeah, well, that seems it? to be what he's implying. Yeah, that it's just, a, it's, a, it's an intake. There's no volition on the part of the person, which like that, you can't really get that from, first off, just from a superficial, like a basic reading of it but also you would need to prove that these are considered passive concepts in the greek world um uh, and in greek speakers at the time and he just asserts it rather than saying anything giving any sort of evidence for it like that's that would be the first thing um when i would think of doing like deep exegesis here like what how were these concepts perceived how was uh learning perceived um listening and learning in context like do those words appear together and i just showed you an example where they do and i'm sure there's lots more like I, i'm telling you i did the most superficial basic thing here i just opened a lexicon and so uh yeah i i wonder it may it yeah i i, I think he's completely just presupposing his own thing here uh and saying greek words essentially huh, interesting okay so uh, just for clarity the the, the big, yeah one of the big questions in this discussion is all right the first thing jesus said okay so a bunch of people they come to they come to jesus and they're like they're grumbling and and they're like hey you know you're you're not god or whatever and and jesus is like okay no one can come to me unless the father who sends me draws them and i will raise them the last day so of course james white thing hey like it's not it's not something that we have control over it is it is james but where it's god who's drawing them and that they they don't have a specific choice about it, and then right after that, in in this specific order of the text, it says it is written the prophets they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from Him comes to Me. So James White, if I'm interpreting it right, he's saying that those are basically the same thing. So that drawing and that that drawing that uh, that the Father does is the same thing as the 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 hearing and the learning and the, the teaching. That's that's all passive. Uh, not you know essentially controlled by us is that a good estimation of of what he's saying i think so i think that's what he's getting at yeah okay all right just to make sure everyone understands that okay so uh, later in in john 12 he um this i think this is yeah this is this is white and you had a, a specific comment about uh basically like he's preemptively james white is preemptively saying hey the illogical they there, this other word in John 12 is a similar situation, and people are saying, hey, in John 12, it's not uh, unconditional election. It's not this like idea of drawing without control, and therefore, mm-hmm. that's good evidence that John 6 is not teaching that. Uh, could, what were your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, only just briefly that okay. um, while it is true you don't want to import 
the meaning of a word in one context to another context. Um, that doesn't mean that it still can't gain something of how an author is using a term. Um, so we want to examine all of John's lexicon in that, like what the words he's using in the gospel, just to see how they're being used. Um, and so I, I, it's, I don't think you should rule out, oh, hey, how is the word draw used in John 12 as compared to John 6? And spoiler, there's not a lot to like to have, uh, the word draw helco means really just to take one thing and kind of moving it to another spot, uh, some, something like that, like as a basic idea. Um, and so like, it's it's not going to particularly help us here, um, but it, it to, to say that there's no help in understanding a word, well, that's just not true. Like you, you wanna see all the different ways that an author uses a term, mm -hmm. um, but it's not really giving you, the word in, in and of itself will not give you anything about the volition or lack thereof of the person um, or how they get into the situation of being drawn. Um, that, that, that's going to be contextual. That's going to, we're going to have to rely on other things. That's all I'm getting at there. Yeah. But most of the time, the word Helco, if I'm, um, mm -hmm. if we're talking about the right thing here is this whole idea of drawing. It is uh, non-volitional and they, they don't have control about when they're being drawn. Right. Is it most of the time? Um, that's a good question. I mean, the, are you talking about in the new Testament? Are you talking about in extra biblical literature mm -hmm. or, or what are you talking about? Oh, I'm, I'm not even sure. Um, it's, that's just what, what I've been told. Um, so, oh yeah. I mean, I would have to, uh, go through like, well, this is the basic, how you start a study on this is you pull up, uh, various different databases that we have. One is the thesaurus lingua Greca, which is all, uh, extant literary resource resources in Greek. I would look up Helco in that. I would look up Helco in, uh, papyri. I would look up Helco in, um, inscriptions. I would look up Helco in the Septuagint, and then you would go from there. Um, I did actually look up Helco just in thinking about this uh, in the Septuagint, and there's really only one occasion uh, where it, uh, I think there's a significant occurrence, which is in one of the uh, kind of intertexts with uh, the, the verse that's being cited here, Isaiah 54. Uh, so Jeremiah 31 actually uses Helco, and we, we could talk about that in a little bit maybe. Yeah. Uh, so I think that probably that language of drawing is being drawn, uh, no pun intended, uh, from, uh, from Jeremiah 31 right. and, and, uh, many think that Jeremiah 31 is an intertext, uh, with Isaiah 54, which is being cited that that text being, they will all be taught of God or, uh, by God. Okay. So just to clarify what I said, uh, NET translation says the word is used of pulling or dragging often by force. So it's often, but not always. Or maybe it would just different. depend on who who is be, yeah. being spoke well, who who is the person doing it what is the object being drawn or dragged or whatever uh what is the context like it words only have meaning in context so mm -hmm. yeah you have you have to examine each on its own and right. see if does this word always have a uh a connotation of like dragging by force away is it used in those contexts um, explicitly or uh uh, or exclusively uh, that, that it's a it's it's a question to ask yeah all right no matter how good your exegetical methodology is or how well you know greek if you start with the wrong presupposition then you will arrive at the wrong interpretation in both languages so our point of contention is not about greek grammar or exegetical methodologies nor is it about me and whether or not i was really reformed or if i'm too man-centered all of those talking points are red herrings that will only distract us from what is our main point of contention in tonight's debate which can be summarized as follows calvinists presume this uh, this audience is unbelieving by default that's white's words by default whereas provisionists teach this audience is unbelieving by their fault in other words provisionists reject the augustinian calvinistic presupposition of total inability so how do we yeah. as provisionists answer the question? Why? Yeah, uh, that was really interesting to hear. Uh, I think you probably can pick up on why that's 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 pretty pretty interesting because the debate is on John six hmm. and the meaning of the text, but he comes out and says it is not about grammar or any exegetical method at all, um, but strictly about presuppositions that's going to determine the yeah, really outcome of the debate, um, which. You, you would think you're going in to try and uh, argue about what this text means, which will then inform your presuppositions, right? That's that's what exegesis is. 
the point of exegesis is to re-examine your presuppositions. And so to say that, you know, all that, that White's going to do is uh, is bring a presupposition and not actually talk about the text, like that's relatively uncharitable, I think. Um, but also he kind of seems to be implying it about himself as well, that like it's just about our presuppositions here. Um, yeah, this is actually about exegesis and I mean, grammar to some respect, like what does the text say? But it's, it's all, we're going to find it's actually a lot less about grammar and syntax as it is about semantics. What do the words mean, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just about, uh, it, it's not just going to be about, we're going to get into pos, right? Like, well, pos, well, who, pop, what's the, you'll keep hearing say, uh, well, the grammar, the grammar of pos. Well, it's really not grammar we're talking about. It's not, we're, not talking about the, we're not talking about the forms of the language, if it's masculine, mm -hmm. feminine, um, if, well, like all that kind of thing. Uh, we're talking about what does it mean? Like, what does, oh, how do we know what it means? And so, yeah, that, it is really about that. And you have to try and find ways of getting at what a text means. And so there were, I think, some ways you could focus on what a text means. And we're, we've already started to talk about them. Um, like, how, how do we get, how do we think about passivity? And uh, whether uh, uh, terms like Manthano are, talking about learning that is or to, or, or a passive or, or uh, activity or a um uh, an active volitional thing and no one really got into that it's really just kind of they're just bypassing each other bypassing the beginning stages here of, of exegesis um so yeah it, exegesis is really important um the main contention is not um i think that people are not that people are rejecting god by default that's not the main point the main point is john six um, that's, that's what they should be dealing with here. Um, and I was, I, like I said, I, I wanted to come into this going, oh, let's learn something new about John six and different ways of thinking about John six. And, uh, particularly how is the old Testament being cited in John six? Uh, but, um, it, that, that didn't really happen. I don't think they ever went to the old Testament context as far as I'm aware. Not, not really Br brief comments. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think Layton's main case is, Hey, I mean, I don't, think he'd specifically say it but um he's you know he's talking about like hey you can't just assume it and then you know there's the, the conversation later that i did a video on it's like you know what's your specific reason to take this specific view and, and like he didn't really answer it so like i don't know if he would say that like you know there's no evidence from the passage but he would say that like we can't just simply assume it and um obviously like in his introduction and all that he was drawing a lot from other passages outside the text, basically saying, hey, like, you know, these other passages which are inspired by God and they're true. If these contradict with your interpretation of John 6, then you shouldn't take that interpretation of John 6, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, which certainly makes sense uh, for me personally. Uh, you know, that brings a whole bit of question of like, hey, you know, how do we interpret those other passages, but also specifically like John six, like you still have to have a specific view of what Jesus is talking about. And um, I, I mean, unless, unless if you're someone that says, Hey, like there could be no contra or there, there can be contradictions, um, which I mean, like there's, there's different like literary ways people speak. So like theoretically, like, I guess you could say that there could be a contradiction without it being an error. Um, I don't know. We don't have to dive into all that though. Um, but let's see here. All right. So, uh, any other last thoughts there? No, we can keep going. Okay. All right. And he reveals his covenant to them. He will instruct them in the way they should choose. So what is the condition? Again, the topic, unconditional election. What is the condition for being taught his covenant? It is for those who fear the Lord in faith. It's similar to what's taught in Isaiah 55, 2 and 3. Listen diligently to me. Eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear to hear. Come to me. Hear that your soul may live. Sound familiar? And I will make with you an everlasting covenant. Notice the parallel symbolism that we saw in John 6. We're inclining your ear to hear. Listening is equated with eating the food, the bread, so that what happens? Your soul may live. And notice, it's those who listen and learn from him that he graciously chooses to bring into an everlasting covenant. In Nehemiah 9.30 of the Septuagint, the Greek word for draw, helko, is the same word we see in John 6.44. It's used for the Hebrew word meshach, and it's literally translated, quote, and you have drawn them for many years and testified against them by your spirit. 
by the hand of your prophets, and they have not listened. In other words, while being drawn by God, they refuse to listen, leading them to become, over time, hardened in that condition. In other words, it's their fault, not a default condition like Dr. White teaches. James yeah. 4.10 says, humble yourself before the Lord, and he will raise you up. Notice the common language seen in John 6. You will be raised up on the last day if you meet what condition? If you humble yourself in faith. In Matthew 22, Jesus illustrates what yeah, he probably about election, which again... All right, what are your thoughts there? Well, just like, first off at the end there, it's very strange to pull in James because it's just a totally different meaning of raise up, right? Like one is talking about resurrection life in John and then James, um, I think it's more talking about like um, being elevated um, in, in like the present life. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's just, that's just a strange connection to make. Very, uh, if you know, ancient Jewish interpretive methodologies, uh, <laughs> um like gazer shawa I, I, like it's this idea of uh taking a word in one text and the, another word has that the text has that same word and then you just connect the text because it has the same word uh, it feels very much like that i don't understand uh the connection there um and even going uh, when he went back he was talking about uh, nehemiah which is a, is an interesting translation he he used there because i went and looked it up and like the nets translation so kind of the standard translation of for nehemiah uh in the septuagint version uh doesn't even have uh draw i don't know if you have the text yeah and you have drawn them for many years uh the nets translation is many years you lasted with them so it's not uh so helco probably in a different context with a, a different semantic um new, uh, range than draw uh, so i'm not quite sure where he's getting that translation from but kind of the mm. standard scholarly translation doesn't have anything to it's not talking really about drawing it's probably a different a different use of the term because uh, terms have many uses right terms can be uh, sure. can mean all sorts of things in different contexts and so that that, that was interesting um sure okay maybe we'll, we'll we just grant that to him i found it really interesting that he cites isaiah 55 uh because isaiah 55 is actually a really important text here and now we could kind of talk a little bit about the old testament context because uh, scholars will agree that, uh, or widely agree that uh, John six is very much dependent on, uh, Isaiah, uh, as a tradition. So Isaiah, not only, uh, 55, but also 54, which is what's going to be cited in John six and then also 53. And so all of these, and then also an Exodus motif is going on, uh, as we see in the dialogue about the manna, which is Exodus 16. Uh, and um, Jesus being compared to the man, that that manna uh, that, the, that the Israelites received in the wilderness. And so there's a lot going on there. Uh, and I think he's right to make the connection. Um, he's making the connection in an interesting way. I think these texts are talking about this kind of new exodus. That's what um, it, will, it will often be called in scholarly literature um, when God fixes the problems of, uh, of the, the Jewish exiles and he restores them to this kind of new, you could even say eschatological glory that's going to come. Mm -hmm. And so that is actually what's going on under, under the hood, so to speak, uh, in many ways in John six. Uh, so drawing on 55 is, is a good idea. Um, However, I think it's going to go a little bit against uh, his point um, when you get to actually 54. And so uh, I think we could probably wait just a little bit longer until we get to um, an actual, uh, th them talking about Isaiah, Isaiah 54 uh, to talk about that. But um, it's, it's gonna go, I think, against Leighton's point to a degree. Um, because in 54, when it talks about being taught of God, it's actually describing like a positive reality. Like it's like, this is what's going to happen. And this is the, the, the blessing. It's not going to be talking about everyone uh, in Israel hearing and some rejecting and some not. It's actually an eschatological um, vision. Uh, uh, it's a, a vision cast for the kind of the perfect future for um, the Judeans. And so uh, it's going to be a, a positive response. So those taught by God are those who like everyone is taught, everyone listens. It's not a kind of a choice on their part there. Um, and he's jumping ahead to 55 to try and prove something from 54. They're different contexts. Mm -hmm. 
uh, like they're very, they're like that while they're still continuing in, in a stream of thought. Earlier on, it's describing everyone, all, everyone has been taught of God because it's like this like beatific kind of vision thing. Mm. Yeah, and so he, the, it's, it's interesting. He's drawing on a lot of texts. Um, like I said earlier, Helco is probably d- derived instead from Gi- Jeremiah thirty one three. Uh, you can see this in in the Septuagint version uh, of that verse, which is actually thirty eight three in the Septuagint. Jeremiah is different in the Septuagint than it is in the Masoretic text, like the the chapters. And so, yeah, in thirty one three, you've got uh, it says, uh, "From afar, Yahweh appeared to me, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loyal love.' Draw like this this drawing idea." Um, which interestingly that it is the same verb, I, I believe, because he said from Nehemiah, uh, that it's, uh, Meshach. And so, yeah, it would be the same one. I'm, it's interesting why he doesn't draw on, on, on Jeremiah instead, because that's probably the intertext, uh, that's going on. Why, and why Jesus is using drawing language. And so, uh, the Septuagint version, uh, which, oh, I see you posted it there. Good. Yeah. So, kurios porothen of the avto. Uh, agapisen eonion egapesa se diatuta ilkusa se is uktirma. And so, like the Lord from afar appeared to him, I loved you with an eternal love on account of this, I drew you towards mercy. Hmm. And so, this idea of being drawn by God towards mercy. Now, Jesus is taking that language of drawing in this new covenant context, which is Isaiah, or sorry, Jeremiah 31. And he's applying that in his, he's put bringing that kind of like uh, potentially uh, kind of poking at the back of the brain of the person who knows their, their, their Greek Bible really well. Go, hey, drawing, where's draw, God drawing in the Old Testament prophets? And you actually won't find it anywhere else in the prophets referring to like God drawing someone. It's only here in Jeremiah 31. And so that's that's a better text, a better intertext, a better text to draw on for God calling people to uh or calling israel to himself bringing israel to himself and i think that's probably more it's more likely the connection going on but um it wasn't brought up at all okay uh amos says layton cited draw from the septuagint to show that the greek word helco doesn't always mean irresistible dragging the context wasn't really his point it was the usage Mm -hmm. fair enough yeah but again i'm not even sure that that's what that meant in nehemiah Uh, Mm -hmm. i gave you the nets translation and so, yeah, um, sure. Yeah, uh, you could probably just pull out a, a lexicon to do that if you wanted to, to say the word doesn't always mean drag, uh, like irresistibly drag. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah you'd want to. Not everyone is a, a scholar like you. They like the pictures. They like to see the word in English. Okay. <laughs> G- give them a break. Gosh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm sorry if I'm coming across as harsh. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> Jesus. It was not conditioned on their nationality. Remember, the calling went to the Jews and to the Gentiles. It was not conditioned on their morality, because remember, the calling went out to the good and the bad alike. But what was the condition? There certainly was one. They came in response to the invitation, clothed in the right wedding garments. In other words, they came in response to the gospel, clothed in the righteousness of Christ by faith. Listen, according to Jesus' view of unconditional election, it's not unconditional at all. Yeah, it's not conditional on nationality, it's not conditional on morality, but it is conditioned on faith in Christ. You must come clothed in his righteousness, not your own righteousness, his. John 12, 32, as was brought up, if I'm lifted up from heaven, Jesus says, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Now notice, I agree with Dr. White, that is a different context. I think Arminians, some of them make mistake by trying to loop, loop these together and make them as if they're the same setting or the same drawing because they're very different. Back in John 6, the Father is specifically drawing Israelites who had previously listened and learned from his teachings through the prophets and through the scriptures, and they are being drawn to believe in the Son. But in John 12, Jesus is doing the drawing, and he's drawing everyone to himself by the gospel, both Jews and Gentiles. As Paul said, the gospel goes first to the Jew and then to the Gentiles. So the bride of Christ after the resurrection is the means by which the gospel goes into all creation, drawing all people to himself. Just before Jesus ascends into heaven, he commissions the disciples yeah, to go and preach okay. the word he gave them. All right. What, what's, what's going on in this passage? Yeah, I mean, he's. it's interesting. He has this kind of like historical interpretation. Like there's something um, like in in the Gospel of John, their they're, they're listening and learning is different than the, the what's going on later on um, with the, the, the church age, the, 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 I guess he used like that term, like church age or something like that. 
Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if, if we need to read John in such a kind of John is being written in at probably the end of the first century with a bunch of Christian theology already kind of in it. Um, and so to say that it's reading it, you're that, that John is being um, the words of Jesus. What I'm trying to say is that the words of Jesus might very well be more theological and um, particular to the end of the first century rather than um way back to like the historical Jesus or something like that. Um, like what, this, we're getting at uh, the idea of like the ipsissima verba versus the ipsissima voxa, like the very words of Jesus or the, like the voice of Jesus, like what, what he was trying to get at with his teaching. Yeah. And so um, I think that John in, in John, it's very possible that um, he's teaching a theology from the time of the present when he's writing the gospel and kind of like it, it's 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 interfacing with some of the things that Jesus said, but it's also John's own kind of spin on things. Um, but uh, besides that, he talks a bit about like uh, like it's only based on the imputed righteousness of Christ, and that's the condition uh, of of um, being uh, in of, of election, um, being the, the imputed righteousness of Christ. I, I don't think we should get into it now, honestly, because we're already at 50 minutes here. But there's a huge debate in New Testament studies uh, as to what um, what the righteousness of Christ is, uh, what it means for th- us to have to be justified, what the, these words, dikaio, which is to justify, um, dikasine, righteousness, dikaios, um, a righteous one. So uh, I think let's just pass by that for now. Um Okay. And we'll kind of stick to the, to the to the main stuff here. The gospel to all creation, so as to draw all people to himself. But prior to his resurrection, that's not what Jesus did. In fact, he seemed to do just the opposite. As Dr. White rightly noted, he was not doing church growth movement here. He was driving them away. I agree with him on all of that. Mark 9, 9 says, they came down from the mountain, and on the way down, Jesus ordered them, don't tell anyone what you've seen. Have you ever had a pastor tell you that? Hey, don't tell anybody about Jesus yet. But that's exactly what Jesus says. Don't tell anybody yet. He says, wait until the Son of Man has been risen from the dead. Recognize that? He isn't drawing everyone yet. Why? Is it because he doesn't really love them? He didn't pick them. He doesn't really want them to believe. Obviously not. Remember, Jesus marveled at the unbelief of Israel. Why would you marvel at their unbelief if they were born by your sovereign decree, unable to believe? Remember, Jesus wept over the unbelief, saying these things are now hidden from your eyes. You have to understand the context. He is using difficult, symbolic language, eat my flesh, drink my blood, to keep them from understanding his true identity. It's a part of his strategic plan of redemption to drive the crowds away. The cross would have never happened if not for this plan to hide the truth using parables, riddles, symbolism, difficult language. How do I know? Paul said as much in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. We declared God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden. Recognize that word? It's a mystery that has been hidden. None of the rulers of the age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Listen, this is a part of God's right. strategic plan. To- yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things going on there. It's really hard to follow sometimes because he's kind of jumping from one thought to another thought, from one text to another text. And like all these texts need to be examined in their own context. Um, and so it, you really can't get too much into all of it. It's interesting that he says that God was not yet drawing everyone. And I think that connects to what I was just saying about like the historical context of John. Like, is John writing in this kind of like interim period? Is he trying to give some sort of um, theology only of that time when these people were engaging who had read the prophets and stuff? Or is he, or is when it says that like, no one comes to me unless the father draws him, mm-hmm. is it actually giving like a true a theology for now? And I think White pushes back on this and probably rightly so uh, that, I think the theology John is talking about in the gospel, he's meant that his audience who are reading it, he thinks that it applies to them as well. Um, and not just to the past, to, to Jewish people at the time. And so it's just, it's strange to kind of have this, this little gap thing that, that that's going on with, with Leighton that he's, he's putting in the text there. Um, I think John at the time of writing the gospel of John thought mm-hmm. everyone uh, that, uh, and yeah, anyone that God draws uh, goes to the Son. Um, that uh, no one is able to come to 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 Jesus unless the Father draws him was applicable at the time of writing the Gospel of John, not just in the past. And so I think that theology is supposed to be still active uh, at the time. And so um, yeah, I'm 
a little bit just confused why he why he would want to make that jump. I understand he has kind of like that his 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 point is uh it's it's his exegesis is based on oh it must be this historical thing where they hadn't learned from the father yet and therefore uh or they weren't listening and learning in the past and therefore but I I think that John is far more focused on the here the here and now at the time of his writing um and is the, and is theologizing at least. Mm, yeah, it makes sense. Verse forty. Uh, but hey, we, I, yeah, we're gonna. Hey, everyone... before we yeah. before we hop to uh, to white, I think it'd probably be good just to talk a little bit about um, Isaiah fifty four. Okay. Uh, or actually, mm, wait, what's his next? Uh, actually, no, let's do white because he's actually about to just jump into it. Let's do that. All yeah. right. Yeah, good timing there. Has this capacity? He ignores the fact that this is a fulfillment. This is Jesus providing the biblical foundation of what it means to draw. It's not what determines God's choice, because what you need to understand is the position just presented removes from God the choice of who his sheep are. Even John 10 was mentioned. I, I've seen so many times uh, in documentaries about uh, keeping sheep, things like that, how the sheep choose their shepherd. No, that's not how it works. But that was what was just presented to you. And so here we have the idea, God the Father doesn't choose a specific people. No, the only people he gives to the Son are those who have learned and followed him, the Father. Which immediately turns the order of the text on its head. Ignores the fact that being taught, the term God there is used in the genitive ablative form, by means of God. So in other words, it's something that's happening to them. They are being taught by God. That's how they're being drawn to the Son, and that's why they'll be raised up in the last day. They're hearing, again, that's something outside of them. They're learning, receiving information outside of them. But what has happened is, is Dr. Flowers has inserted an entire anthropology, not from Romans 1, but an entire anthropology into verse 45, which grants to people the capacity to hear and learn, and therefore they follow the Father, and therefore they're given to the Son. Because they're one, yeah, yeah. in unity of purpose, at least. In that. So this is really interesting. Um, I'll briefly just comment again on the Greek thing. So he uses terms from Greek grammar. He says a genitive ablative. Um, which would just be the idea. So a genitive is like of, so like the love of God, the car of Steve, like Steve's car, the um, discipling of Tim. Like, is that Tim doing disciple, discipling people? Is that the type of discipling that Tim did? Like, it's like this of statement. And so it's very hard in Greek to know exactly what it, the this of that, like what is the relationship being described? And ablative is just one way of describing that, which would be something like by means of, something that is happening to so taught of god would be taught by means of god that is all that conveys it does not say anything about the volition of the people being taught you can't just say a greek phrase a, a greek uh, grammatical category or a semantic category and then say oh and that means therefore that they're passive in this learning that it is a genitive ablative, like it just has nothing to do with anything. Um, that, it, that, that you're not going to get that, um, the volition or lack thereof from the grammatical or in semantic category that's going on here. So again, just throwing terms out doesn't help. And that's not going to help. Um, so it's a bit strange. Uh, he also talks about this, like, don't read back. Like, don't circle back. Like, you got to keep going forward in the text. Um, he says that Leighton reads 645 backwards into the previous verses. I'll just uh, quickly reiterate to people what 645 is here. Uh, so everybody has it on uh, in their mind. So 644 is no one is able to come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up in the last day. And 645 is it is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who hears from the father and learns comes to me. Mm -hmm. And so White says, oh, you can't read back. But. You got, this is John. This is the Gospel of John. Um, John is known, and anyone who's read John knows that he's it's circular. It's like it's going round and round. Like I'll say a thing one way, and I'll say it another way, and I'll come back to it, and I'm going to say it again. It's not like Paul, where it's just like 
very frequently, very didactic, very like, therefore, 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 therefore. John is very like circular. He'll say he, he will um, try and give you different pictures of the same thing. And so that for one thing, that's just the way that John writes. Okay. So it, there's, there's no reason you're not allowed to say something he said earlier should help us understand, understand something later. And so that that's normal. But in 645, uh, when it says that, uh, when it gives a scriptural citation, um, that they will be taught by God, that is the support for the previous statement. Like the, Jesus is, is making an argument here. So he's saying that no one is able to come to father except um, that God, that he draws them. Well, let me tell you about that through a scriptural citation. So he, reading backwards is fine here because these are mutually interpreting each other. Hmm. Um, so, it's, it's, it's like this phrase is almost parallel to the previous one. Uh, they're supposed to interpret each other. Um, you, you see other phrases also in John, like uh, in, in uh, where I think you're, they're all kind of the same thing, but using different imagery. So you've got not only uh, anyone, anyone who comes, uh, no one is able to come except the Father draws him. Um, and then you've got the uh, being taught of God. You've got uh, listening and learning, but then you've got also eating my flesh and drinking my blood. You've also got looking at the sun and believing. You've also got like, uh, there's just different ways of saying the same reality that's going on here. And so that, that needs to be taken into account that all of these are going to be interpreting each other. Hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. Really interesting. Okay. All right. Ready for Isaiah? Uh, let's, uh, yeah, well, let's just, no, let's just talk about Isaiah a bit here. So we're, we're dealing with an old, no one here is actually talking about the Old Testament text. They're saying taught of God. They're saying this comes from Isaiah or Jeremiah, but they're not, um, they're not looking at that context to give them any help in what, what this text, what that might mean for the text at hand. And so I already said this a bit, but Isaiah 54 is an eschatological, like a beatific vision for the future. And so those who are taught of God, and this goes to White's point, like this will help White in his, in his argumentation, had he brought this up, is that it's a positive depiction. Uh, it is saying these are those who are taught. And then the very next verse, uh, let me pull it up to make sure I cite it right. Uh, so, and all your children shall be taught of Yahweh. And so this is the parallelism. The peace of your children shall be great. So that that's the parallel. So that to be taught is to also have peace. And so it's, it's, it's a, it's a positive evaluation. So those who are taught of God are those who have come to God, so to speak. They are those who have the revelation of Yahweh. And so it's the new, it's this new covenant idea that we start to see in Isaiah 54, 55, Jeremiah 31 being applied to um, the, the situation that we're seeing uh, in John six. And so it's Jesus really saying that this eschatological reality of Isaiah 54 is coming to fruition here and now. And so you need to understand that in light of the situation that we're in here. Um, the way that New Testament authors cite old, the Old Testament is very much contested and very much uh, a lively debate. Right. Uh, one way that I like to think about it is the category of uh, metalepsis that uh, Richard Hayes has um, discussed, which is this, this idea that you uh the, the old testament actually you know I, I i think i probably have a just a um richard hayes himself i think i have a, a have it written down just so that i can cite the man himself so the literary technique of citing or echoing a small bit of a precursor text in such a way that the reader can grasp the significance of the echo only by recalling or recovering the original context from which the fragmentary echo came and then reading the two texts and then reading the two texts in dialogical juxtaposition. And so what's going on in this text, and so in, in John 6, is that you've got this eschatological reality of Isaiah 54 being brought in now in John 6 to that context, and it's the idea of inaugurated eschatology, right? It's what you see uh, that if you believe you have eternal life, that's coming, like I think a couple verses later, uh, that this, this thing that was talked about, this new covenant with the mercies of David, uh, in Isaiah 55, uh, and the, the new covenant, that term being used in Jeremiah 31, uh, that is happening in the here and now in John. 
-hmm. And so uh, you're supposed to you're supposed to bridge the gap, right? And so the one who believes has eternal life now, and that's 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 what Jesus is saying. So he's saying that uh, there are those who will be taught of God. That is those who will enter into this eschatological reality, and the one who listens and learns is that person, right? And so uh, it is stating a positive reality. Those taught of God are those who listen and learn if you're following the Old Testament context. Uh, that's what Isaiah 54 is talking about. And so that really does negate what we're going to come across really soon, right? About the whole past pond, pandas thing of uh, which all refers to what, because it, in Isaiah 54, it, it is a positive statement. And it should be taken that way that these are those who have learned from Yahweh in in, in the in the um, effective sense or however you want to use it. Okay. So just for some yeah. clarity, um, Jordan asked all your children in this passage. It doesn't mean like Calvinistically elect children, right? All your Calvinistically elect children that. Oh, uh, like it, oh, in the in the Masoretic text, yeah. Or sorry, and and the Septuagint there. Yeah, I mean. First off, I, you should note that John omits all your children in his citation. Uh, and scholars have said, and I agree, that it's probably for a theological reason here. Because uh, the debate in John 6 and previously is about Jesus as the son from heaven. And uh, the, the lineage of people is going to be brought up a lot. So you're going to have uh, him saying, "Your fa like, uh, oh, our fathers were in the wilderness and our lineage and our this. And Jesus will say the only thing that matters is the one who's from heaven, the son from heaven. And so if you include son language here, that could really buttress their own ideas. And so scholars have said um, that it's probably removed. Sons is removed to get rid of that lineage sonship kind of thing for in a um, biological sense, because the text is really about the one son from heaven who you must learn from. He is the embodiment of being taught of God because he is God, right? This whole text is a is about um, very very much about why learning from Jesus or following Jesus is listening and learning from the Father. Like these are these are just the same reality being described in different ways. Really, that's what's going on. The whole like the Gospel of John is very focused on the um, the oneness of of Jesus and the Father. And so when when he's saying like uh, if you're listening and learning from the Father, then you're going to come to the Son. It's like because they, they're they're teaching the same thing. I think Leighton says this as well. They're they're both. If you if you come to one, you're coming to the other. If you uh, and um, that's kind of the point, right? And it even uh, a little just the, the very following verse in in John six, uh, verse forty six, right after it says, uh, "Anyone who hears from the Father and learns comes to me." Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. This one has seen the Father. Like, did you see how that's the wink there? Like the wink of like wink wink. Uh, you're no one, no one's getting taught by God. No, the God, the father is not teaching anyone in a classroom here. He's not here. But if you're listening to me, if you're coming to me, then you are listening and learning from the father. Right. And so that like, that's, that's the whole uh, rhetoric of this dialogue is uh, Jesus is, is being so closely identified with God. Right. Um, I have a friend, I won't name them at, uh, because they might not want their name to this idea, but uh, a friend at Cambridge, uh, who uh, said to me, I wonder if in the gospel, uh, some people wonder if Jesus is God is considered God in the synoptic gospels. Uh, I wonder in John, if Jesus is considered a human because he's so elevated in his deity. It's like, he's, 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 he's like, he's right on par with God. And it's just, it's such a high pos um, position given to, to, to him. It's like, is he even human in the gospel of John? I'm not saying that, that, it's true or not true. I'm just saying that he makes that statement because it's just such an elevated position of Jesus in this gospel um, that, again, to hear and learn from the Father, you are then listening to the Son. Mm. That's the point being made, right? Um, yeah, and so then I, you, you could ask the question, and we are asking the question, listening and learning. Uh, is that something that people do? Is that an active thing that people do? Um it needs to be established, right? Like, you, like the, James makes the case, Leighton makes the case. No one really actually gets into these, into the the semantics of these verbs. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there because we want to keep going. We're going, we're going kind of far here. 
Uh, I would say based on the parallel usage that we see in John. So what I was saying about listening and learning is the same thing as eating and drinking is the same thing as believing is the same thing as um, what's the other one looking on the sun. Like all of these are just interchange things. And so, and even at the beginning of this passage, it says, what work do we have to do? Well, what is the thing we have to do to, 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 to get the bread? And she says, this is the work that you have to do. Trust, believe. Hmm. So I think the thrust of the passage then is saying that all these things are saying what someone has to do, what it means to listen and learn is just to trust, to believe. Hmm. Okay. So just for some clarity. So, <clears throat> so you think that these are referring to, I guess, the same people with all and everyone um, and, and 645, but just for specifically, so like, and even though it's the same, you you still wouldn't say that Isaiah fifty four thirteen, which Jesus is quoting, we don't have any reason to think that that's referring to like some type of Calvinistic drawing, right? No, it does. It it no, it doesn't say anything on that. There's nothing about the text that would say that. You'd have to figure that out a different way. That's just saying that those people in this verse were those who learned. It's this eschatological reality, okay. um, like it's a positive statement. So. Those who were taught by God are those who listened and learned. Mm -hmm. And just for more clarity, so it seems like your position is that, hey, the, the people that are being taught and learning are the same people at the same time. Uh, the the previous verse about the drawing, like because it's John that they, um, like it could be like in a different order. Like, is that how you're, you're explaining it? Like, I guess why you don't specifically take a Calvinist view on this, this passage. Well, I think they're all just like describing a similar reality. And he's trying to, uh, if you're thinking about like the historical circumstance of like John writing the gospel of John, uh -huh. you've got him writing, let's say at the end of the first century, there are Jewish people who aren't believing. Right. And he's going like, so why aren't they, 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 they believing? Well, they're not being drawn by the father to the son. Um, uh, because they're not believing they're not trusting so they uh, it's really just like a kind of a rhetoric against that um yeah that's all i'm getting at so what is what is the drawing what what so Leighton thinks it's the i guess the teaching of the gospel or christ mm -hmm. uh, but what is the drawing specifically in your opinion well it's just it it's just another way of describing the other the other realities um that i was just saying like it's uh if you're It's it it it's 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 along the same lines of believing. It's along the same lines of uh, eating and drinking. All these things like it, God. It's just God bringing people to the Son because of them doing these actions. It's 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 all this kind of like um, almost like a like a portrait rather than a uh, like some sort of logical. Um, uh -huh. Does the drawing happen before the eating or anything like that? I don't think that that's the case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Maybe we'll dive into that a little later. So, sure. uh, 5350. Uh, okay. What each one of us was going to say is pretty obvious, but you have to start at 45, remove it from what it means in its context, read it backwards, and that's what you get. Now, in the cross examination, one of the questions I'm going to ask is so, do these people who are going to be raised up in the last day, did they have the capacity? in and of themselves to come to the Father? Or was there a special supernatural drawing needed for them to come to the Father? So did they have the free will to accept the Father's teaching or reject the Father's teaching? And hence, enable the Father to then choose them to give them to the Son? Why can you come to the Father freely but not come to the Son freely? How does that work? I don't know. We're going to have to find out because there's nothing in John 6 about it. That's not an explanation of why these people don't believe. You see, you have to take verse 45, remove it from its context, insert an entirely foreign anthropology into it, preach it, you know, bring up all sorts of, of stuff and talk about, you know, God not loving them to try to do the emotional thing. But you just can't walk through John 6 and then understand why at the end you have the result that you have. Because of what he was really saying is, well, you know, the, the, ones, the ones that come to me, I, 
I can't explain to you why you're not coming to me because you know, if, if you just accept the Father's teaching, if you just accept that you learn from the Father, you've got the freedom to do this, you have the power, you have the capacity, you have free will, you can do it. That's how it works. That would have been an easy explanation, but that's not how Jesus explained these things. And in fact, he kept repeating their incapacity to come to him unless enabled by the Father. But the whole argument is, the way around this from Dr. Flowers is, that may be true, but we deny to the Father the capacity and ability to choose those that he gives to the Son. Instead, those that are given to the Son are those who have fulfilled these purposes, and hence you have a denial of unconditional election. Because really the only election going on here is that God chooses to give the people who have freely come to him, to his Son, and entrust them with their salvation. Now, it, again, it strikes me as very odd because it sounds like they have the freedom to either come to the Father or not come to the Father, but once they're given to the Son, they lose their free will? We'll have to find out during uh, cross-examination okay, exactly yeah. how that works. I mean, this is all similar to what I was just saying. Like, the point of John is if you're listening to the Father, you're listening to Jesus. If you're listening to Jesus, you're listening to the Father. Like, I, I just think that he's missing, like, this kind of circular way that John talks. Hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, he and the Father about, are, are one. Uh, Sorry, so go ahead. kind of critiquing Leighton there. Um like assuming they learn beforehand what you have to say about mm -hmm. that so say that again it's in your notes here you oh. Tell me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> i'm not even re looking at my notes man i'm just talking <laughs> uh just assuming that that yeah that uh you have to have learned uh, like oh you can't come to jesus but um but you can come to the father I just think it's again missing the point of John that John is saying that if like Jesus and John, uh, the Father's teaching is being equated with coming to Jesus, they're being being put in par like at parallel, and so if you're coming to the if you have a relationship with the Father, if you were to have a relationship with God the Father, you would go to Jesus. That's the point of the text, um, and so you will be directed to Jesus if you have a direct a, a, a disposition towards God the Father then you're going to go towards Jesus. That's all it's getting at. Um, I, mm. Yeah, I, I don't see kind of the, the, the problem there in White's, like I, he's saying that you, yeah, I, I think he's just missing the point of the text, like missing the point of the oneness of the two. Mm. Yeah, um, so quick thoughts here. Uh, Jordan Thurber says, Leighton backed up th that with many other texts that he cited. So the the whole assuming they learned before beforehand from the father. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, like he backed up that people have to learn from God. Um, like what, what what's he saying? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm not not entirely sure. Um, but all right, we, we like, I think that the idea that people have to respond to God is definitely all over the place in the Bible for sure. Yeah, I, I sorry. Maybe I haven't made this clear. I actually think Leighton's claim that like listening and learning from the Father is is describing the reality of those who are taught by God in Isaiah fifty four, um, and is describing like what that person is doing. I think that's 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 right. That they are the ones they are actively listening to to the Father. They're listening and learning, which it means that they are those who are taught of God according to Isaiah fifty four. And so I, I agree with that. I'm just trying to talk around and talk about other issues as well here to think about. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. It's Isaiah 54 is 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 basically just the same thing being described in other terms when it comes to those who listen and learn, um, listen from the Father and learn. And so, um, I, by all appearances, it does it it is something that is what they're doing. That is equivalent to them eating. You have to actually take the food and eat like all these things. I think the text is clear enough in its description of that is something that the, that you have to do. Um, I'm just trying to talk about all the other things around the text that could that that weren't discussed that could that needed to be considered in this in this debate. Does that make sense? Yep. So it was presented and I think it wasn't presented with enough clarity to necessarily catch it that it is the key issue in our discussion of John chapter six this evening. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so 
there he's saying um, that his, his words approximately are, if, verse 45, is a description of how people come to the sun, then everything Leighton says collapses. So he says, like, he wins the debate, uh, and that, and that's it. And what's interesting here is that in some ways, um, well, it, it, no, it, it, that's not a win of the debate. It is, though, really important um, for to, to, to discern, though, whether or not uh, – who who the the every is in each case so you've got and they all will be taught by god so everyone will be taught by god next part of the verse everyone or all who hear from the father come and learn uh, come uh, and learns comes to me white says that Leighton loses the debate if those are the all in both instances are uh are are the same thing and what I found really shocking was that actually Leighton says, yes, he agrees. I don't know if it's in this clip or another clip. He says, yes, I would lose the debate. Mm -hmm. But that really is beside besides the point, right? You, it still doesn't establish anything about volition here. It doesn't establish, like, you could have um, everyone who's taught by God are those who respond to uh, Yahweh, uh, eschatologically speaking, um, which is what I've already talked about. So yeah, it's those who are taught by God. Uh, they have this, they, they responded, they have this eschatological thing happening now to them. It, the dawning of the, the of the um of the of that reality. And so then also you could describe that as everyone who hears from the Father and learns comes to me. Um that doesn't prove White's point about anything. Uh it's just saying that, okay, the first one, yes, they are those who respond positively, and the second one. Is this for the description of that? Um, I don't see how that in any way, shape, or form establishes White's point. Um, there's you still have to figure out uh all the other factors that we've been talking about. It doesn't actually include uh, or uh inform the debate in any way. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh so you mentioned that um <laughs> uh in, in the notes here you have 5230. Lighten and retorts rightly that listening and learning are not passive realities. Um, I don't know what 5230 is because it's not right. Um, did you want to comment mm. on that? <laughs> uh, just a sec. I just lost my notes here. Where'd they go? Oh, that's just what I'm talking about. Um, okay. Yeah, that Leighton is assuming then that, oh, uh, Israel is depicted as failing to learn. So those taught of God are, uh, because other places in the Bible say that Israel failed to learn, that those who are taught of God in Isaiah 54, therefore, is all of Israel, and they may or may not have been taught well or, or, or received that teaching. But that's just not yep. what the Old Testament context is there. Mm, I see. Yeah. Okay. All right one has the ability to come to Christ. Don't we have free will? They don't have the ability to believe in one whom they've not been taught about. Just like I said, they have to be drawn by the teaching of God. So it's a matter of communicating uh, facts or data uh, to someone. Is that what the... Uh... If you want to call the gospel facts and data, okay. I mean, the gospel is the power of God into salvation. It's the light. It's the sword of the spirit. It pierces in through not only bone and marrow, but into the heart, and it affects our lives. Just like, you know, you may say, sticks okay. and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Words have power. Okay, so a person who is drawn, again, looking at verse 44, a person who is drawn by the Father, by, by the, Father the Son is being taught by God, is, that, is, that, is being taught the gospel by God the Father. Well, Hebrews 1 says, in days of past, God spoke through the prophets and other various means, but in these days, he speaks through his son, and then, of course, the apostles and the bride. So in that day, in John 6, it's a transitionary period of being taught through the prophets and the law, and now it's transitioning through being taught through Jesus and the bride of Christ through the gospel that's being sent to all of creation. So everyone who is drawn by the Father to the Son, um, does, is that... Is that it, Today is that all people, or is is there what 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 differentiates um, as to who is being drawn by the Father? Well, we live in the church age, so that the drawing is by Jesus to Himself. Jesus draws all people once He's raised up, and He's been raised up. 
And so he sends the gospel to go into all creation, and through the bride and through the gospel, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, through the apost- teaching of the apostles, we are now being drawn through the teaching of, of Christ. So the Father is no longer drawing people to the Son? Well, there may be people who read the Law and the Prophets prior. There's people in the Jewish tradition may, may come to Christ through the teachings of God the Father. But there, it's, as you know, it's a triune God. So God may draw through various means. In the Old Testament, it was, the, as Hebrews 1 says, it was the Father so, that drew so, his t- the prophets. So actually, verse 44 isn't continuing, continuing true today. Something has changed to where um, when Jesus says, I will raise him up on the last day, who is it that Jesus will raise up on the last day? Everyone who comes to him in faith. Everyone who comes to him in faith. And yet in verse 44, who is it that Jesus will raise up on the last day? Well, in verse 44, like you, you, you acknowledge, the difference between the context of chapter 12 and chapter 4 is chapter 4 is still prior to the I crucifixion. Think you, I think you mean chapter 6. I'm sorry, yes, chapter 6, 44. Um, and so in chapter 6, he's drawing those who believe in the Father, who have listened and learned from the Father, he's drawing them to the Son. And they will be raised up in the last day. For example, um, Simeon would have been a good example of this. He was a God-fearing man. He would have been drawn to believe in Jesus. But after Christ is raised up, that's when he says to go and spread the gospel to all people. And so that's the means by which he draws all people today is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you and so, I came through the drawing of Jesus. So we didn't come through the drawing of the prophets. So everything in, in John 6 has now changed. Um, uh, is, is the eating, eating of the flesh, drinking the blood, uh, has all of that changed now that Jesus is doing the drawing rather than the Father doing the drawing? No, because all of that is symbolism to listening and learning to the drawing that comes through our God, either through the prophets or through the apostles. Either one is still God doing the drawing. It's just at different means at different times. And so, so they're still eating the flesh by listening and inclining their ear to hear the gospel, just like when they inclined their ear to hear Moses. So if they did, believed Moses, they would believe Jesus. Sorry. So, so, did any, so did every person who was drawn by the Father to the Son come to the Son? In that context, I have no problem with that interpretation because he's not drawing them unconditionally. He's drawing them conditioned upon the fact that they listen and learn from the Father. So the only way for you to understand verse 44 is to have your interpretation of verse 45, right? Well, I, obviously we have interpretations of both verses and they correlate together, but, but it's but the same. It's a, this is the yeah, same view that there. Michael Brown. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, that's like the most obvious possible thing, that last thing that Layton was just saying there. Uh, um, or sorry, that White was saying, like the only way you can have your interpretation of the previous verse is to understand the next verse. It's like, well, yes, uh, yeah, my interpretation of the next verse informs my interpretation of the previous verse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, understand. Like, if John is talking in, in circular language or like returning to things and saying things in different ways, if he if he's going to then describe, if he says, okay, no one can come to me except the Father draws him. Oh, this is like the scripture. It's like those in the eschatological age, they'll listen to God. Oh, and you know what that's like? That means that they've listened and learned. So they've they've responded to God. Uh, and that's what that's like. Okay, well then that's describing the reality of those who are going to be drawn by God to the Son. Like it's all you can't disconnect that. It's all mutually interpretive. Um, that's how you do exegesis. You don't one verse doesn't just once you move to the next verse, you don't the previous verses don't disappear. Like um, they're building on each other. And just because John isn't using inferential particles, like, so therefore like he, he's, it's just kind of statement um, put beside another statement, put beside another statement. And they're supposed to be in, mutually in, interacting with each other. So yeah, it was a very crazy statement by white there. I, that didn't make any sense. Hmm. Uh, we should probably get to like, they're talking about the, the whole, uh, the, they, the pandas thing. Right. All right, so let's let's try not to spend too much time on that because I kind of already talked about it. But this yeah. is for you. Oh, it's just it was just you did a video on this, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Listen and learn because that's their responsibility. You can reject what you hear. So everyone in Israel was taught by God, and so you see a distinction between that and everyone hearing from the Father. That's a different group. Uh, no, I, I believe that all of Israel has heard. They, not all of them listened, but all of them heard, because you're responsible whether you listen to your teacher or not. If you but, tune out your teacher and ignore what he says, that's your fault, not God's fault. But it says, everyone, pas, everyone hearing from the Father and learning does what? They come to Jesus. So if it was all of Israel, why didn't all of Israel come to Jesus? You're, you're ignoring the fact that you have the ability to listen and believe. If, if you hear the message, if, like everybody in this room just heard me teach, is everybody in this room going to believe what I taught? No, some of them are going to reject what I taught. You're responsible for what you do with what you hear. But just because they hear doesn't mean they'll listen and learn and believe. 
but it specifically states everyone hearing from the Father will come to me. How is that not clearly? Everyone who has listened and learned, it says. In other words, they, they heard and they learned, which implies that they believed. It doesn't say everyone believed. It says everyone has heard the message, and therefore they're responsible for the message they got, they've been given. But, but it okay, says yeah. every hearing one. Yep. Yeah, so he, if they just keep going on on this for a while, and you've already talked about it a bit, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, Leighton did not need to, to fight this at all, right? He, he could have just said, yes, everyone uh, in the verse... And they will all be taught by God. Is are the same people who are the all who hear from the Father and learn come to me. They're both. It's they're both talking about Isaiah fifty four. Those who in the eschatological age will be taught by God. This common motif in Jewish literature, uh, in the Old Testament and elsewhere, that God Himself will. That's actually an important point. That God Himself will teach people including the nations. Uh, actually, if you go to the Septuagint version of uh, Isaiah 54, the next verse, or verse 15, I should say, of chapter 54, uh, it uh, it talks about uh, proselytes or uh, sojourn or foreigners who also learn. Um, and so, like, the, the message is that, uh, this idea is that God himself is going to teach. And then Jesus is appropriating this in the Gospel of John because He's God, right? Like that it's on the nose. It's like God is actually teaching you here, like literal God in the flesh, uh, and you're missing it. And so that that's actually an important thing to 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 to, to point out here. But um, anyways, like the uh, it, it it even if you say the all in both instances are the same people, uh, that doesn't negate Leighton's point. You could just say that okay, uh, there's still people who listened and learned. Uh, that's, that's, it's talking about those who uh, do have this pot, this, uh, eschatological experience, um, of being taught by God. Like you can just say that and say r white is right, that they're both, both alls refer to the same thing. And that doesn't change his point at all. And so the fact that he conceded and said, I would lose the debate if the first one is the, is a different, uh, or is not a different all doesn't make any sense to me. Um, there's no reason for to say that that you still all of your points, all of what you're saying about it being listening and learning from the Father are those who um, uh, are drawn to Christ. That all still counts if you take into account Isaiah 54 is referring to a positive reality um, where the people do respond. And so it just it didn't make any sense to me why why he would focus on that or think that he'd lost the debate somehow. Um, again, maybe it has something to do with yeah not knowing Greek or something like that, or not being able to refer to it or not being sure. I mean, you could always make the case that the, the all is different. Like you'd have to establish that there are other cases in the new Testament. You can think about like, where uh, what is it? Romans five, like all in Adam die, but all in Christ will be made alive. Like hmm. unless you're a universalist or like leaning that way, <laughs> you, typically those are taken differently. Yeah. Uh, as in uh, one group is different from the other, all in Adam or one, all, all in Christ are different all. Uh, in this context, though, that's pretty hard to establish because in Paul, he does say all in Adam, all in Christ. These are different groups of which the all is referring to, right? Uh, whereas here, it's just side by side, everyone taught of God, mm. everyone listening and learning from the Father. So to insert that exegetically, which is what Leighton is trying to do, uh, that's that's kind of hard to do just when it comes to like, like the discourse analysis here and like the it, there's there's nothing in the text that would prompt that you have to kind of insert that from afar um based on his presuppositions here and so um i think you could just say white is right yeah yeah both this refers to the same thing but that doesn't establish your point anymore in any way shape or form hmm. yeah so just for some clarity so you you're saying that the the all and everyone that like you know we don't have any reason from the text to see that they're separate specifically and you know that's that seems to be basically what Leighton was said even though he didn't specifically say it he just didn't answer the question uh, but he didn't answer it yeah he was he very much dodged it so and you know why he why he decided to do that or he was confused or didn't even understand the question uh, I'm not terribly sure what it was but either way so um, so what you're saying is 
like like he Leighton was saying, hey, like you can't see him at James, uh, but Leighton was, you know, it is possible, and um, and you're saying that like, hey, like there's no specific reason, and maybe even, would you even say that you, we would expect John to mention it or and technically, you know, Jesus to mention it, that they are separate things if they were supposed to be separate things? Would you say that? Well, I mean, they're literally side by side in the same verse and mutually interpretive taught of God. And then it's talking about those who like listen and learn, you learn, you're taught the, the, the learners are taught. And so it's, it's describing the same reality. Um, I, I, to say that they're different groups somehow is that just exegetically, that's very um, precarious. That does just in basic communication to assume that, uh, that, that, that would, that's requiring a lot of your audience to somehow import um, a different meaning there to, to, to all, especially what I was saying about um, Old Testament citations. If, if he's citing this text, he's expecting his audience, in my perspective, um, that they would go back and they would understand what's being referred to here and do the, use the principle of, of Hayes. Of, uh, obviously, they didn't use this term, but metalepsis, the idea of um, bridging the, the context. Yeah. And so it's a positive context. It is those who positively respond. It is those who listen and learn. I see. But again, that does nothing to establish White's point. Mm. Uh, it's just saying, it's it's another way of saying the same thing. They listened and learned. They're taught of God. They are those who are participating in eternal life now. I mean, Jesus is going to say that in like, how many verses? Uh, yeah, uh, the next, the next, verse 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who believes has eternal life. And so it's, it, it's very much, uh, sorry, I'm just pulling up my text here. You've got these, uh, for if we want to use Greek, yeah, it's just a whole bunch of participles, as, as White was pointing out, of different ways of describing the same reality. So in verse 47, it's the one believing has eternal life, hopis devon. It's a, and so it's just this talk, one way of describing it is someone who believes. Another way of describing it, if we go back to, uh, uh, verse 45, it's the one, again, participle, the one hearing, the one learning. Also, uh, just this participle describe another way of describing the same reality. Um, and this happens all over the place. The one eating, the one drinking. And it's just this constant reiteration in chapters five and six of what it means to have eternal life um, and uh, what you have to do for that. And there's different metaphors to describe the same thing. Hmm. I see. Okay. Okay, of course it is. Okay, I just don't, I just don't believe that's quote unquote Calvinistic uh, theology well, is being okay. introduced. Sounds, sounds, it's biblical theology has been okay. there from the beginning. Okay, from Genesis. All, right, all right, okay. Um, you you told a um, an uh, a, one of your Calvinist friends that was debating with an atheist or somebody that was debating with an atheist, um, and he brought up total inability. He brought up Calvinistic theology, and he says you said quote There's no reason to be discussing the sovereign grace of God and things like that with someone who just doesn't even believe. And so I'm wondering why you think Jesus is introducing these doctrines to a bunch of grumbling, gungus mooing Israelites in massive percent. category difference. <laughs> wow, um, he is. <laughs> Joel. Uh, Joel, Joel messaged me. Where are we? Because um, yeah, I think that we're just continuing on a clip that we weren't gonna listen to, so I'm not quite uh, sure. <laughs> uh, One twenty six oh four. Nice. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so basically, it's like, uh, you know, sovereignty from. I think you gotta keep. You gotta keep going. You gotta keep okay. going. Right. Right. We'll let, keep explaining playing. Yeah. the fact that these individuals have come seeking him, but they are not seeking him for who he is as Messiah. They do not understand that he is the source of spiritual life. And why would he say that to them? Well, because it's recorded for us in Scripture, so that two thousand years later we could be sitting here and looking at it. Okay, so you equate drawing with regeneration, basically. Um, you believe someone must be made alive, regenerated, in order to come to the life giver who is Christ. Yet on page 25 of this book here, drawn by the Father, you wrote, quote, when we come to him, when we believe on him, he becomes the source of our spiritual life. Well, isn't regeneration the source of our spiritual life, not Jesus, on your view? No. That's, that's so obviously false. I'm not even sure how to address it. Uh, the only way that you can have spiritual life is that Jesus Christ is provided for the work of the Spirit through his redeeming work to even raise us to spiritual life. So the idea of separating regeneration from the person of Jesus is an absurdity. 
but you must be regenerated prior to coming to Jesus. So before you're unified with Jesus, you well, have I don't, life. First of all, I don't, I don't agree uh, that drawing is the same thing as regeneration. That's not the terminology. I think we ought to stick with what John 6 is actually talking about. John 6 defines the drawing by the Father as teaching, learning, and, uh, and hearing. That's the definition of drawing. It results in a person being raised up at the last day. That's the meaning in the context. Actually, I'll, no read, a, I'll read a quote from you where you actually equate drawing with regeneration later, but I'll have to pull that out. Um, what support do you have for equating this concept of regeneration with the word draw in the sense that you, you obviously believe that drawing must involve regeneration because it has to proceed their believing, doesn't it? Well, again, I, I'm, I'm here to debate John chapter 6. If you want to talk about all sorts of other things, that seems to be your thing. I just talked but about draw. That seems to be Helco. your thing, and I, I realize, Leighton, it's, it's, it's all you've got. I but asked you the about reality is, The reality is, as we have seen, what is found in verse 44 is the assertion that no one has a certain capacity unless something happens. And that drawing is an effective drawing. It's not talking about issues of regeneration. It's not talking about adoption. It's not talking about sanctification. It's not talking about a lot of things. But what it is explaining is without it, there will be no eternal life. Can you explain from your perspective? Uh, Joel. All right. L let's, okay. Hey. So w do you have any idea what the, the specific, clip, specific clip was supposed to say? 126.04. Uh, There's a lot of clips we have to go through here, so forgive us, anyone watching. <laughs> yeah, um, it was funny. Uh, Zach and I were kind of just going back, like, oh, well, what different clips can we use? And then I was using it on my phone, uh, and I would, when I would, like, go to look for a clip, I would hit the time, uh, the time stamp, and it would switch between counting backwards and counting forwards. And I was inserting some times that were going backwards, and he was doing ones forwards. <laughs> It was a whole thing. So yeah, yeah. Our, our dear, our apologies for that. Yeah, yeah. Apologize. Thank you. <laughs> you don't think that that's reflecting on the T of two total inability, the, the default condition. And yet he still plays the clip. Yes, that's probably wrong. We're, no, it's, it's, this is it. I promise. Of course but, it is. Okay. Of course no, it is. Okay. I just don't, I just don't believe that's quote unquote Calvinistic uh, theology well, is being okay. introduced. It kind of it's biblical theology. It's been okay. there from the beginning. Okay. From Genesis. All right. Okay. Um, you, you. Okay. I guess you didn't really have anything to say there. Okay. All right. Oh, I mean, uh, the clip we were looking for is they're going to talk about sovereignty in the Old Testament, being a chosen people. Uh, White, White says that they, the sacrifices were for them. And he, like, assumes when he states that, that um, these things must mean that they are, uh, like, elect in the sense of Calvinism, elect in the sense of they are the only people who have any sort of uh, hope of salvation or anything like that. Um, but it just seems to, to me to completely misunderstand like what is the function of what are the functions of sacrifices in the Levitical system? What does it mean to be chosen in the Old Testament? Are they chosen like to salvation or are they chosen to revelation, to be a light to the nations, mm. um, bringing mediation of God's presence as priests to the nations? They are they're a holy priesthood, and so Israel has that function. And so it, I don't think that that calling or function is equivalent to being saved. And he just seems to, and he seems to think that because they have sacrifices, therefore they're saved or something like that. Um, that's not the function of these things. Uh, but we don't need to get into all that now. Where this is already a pretty long stream, so we, we can we can hop forward. Uh, he's going to talk about Ephesians as well. Uh, he goes on a rant a bit about Ephesians one. James does. Uh, I mean, we could talk about Ephesians one, but I feel like that's a whole other stream. Maybe we could save that for another time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unless you want to. Go into Just Ephesians on Ephesians. Is it his, his two second uh, thoughts on Ephesians? Right. They responded in faith, just okay. like the scripture says. So you are introducing a distinction between pontes and pos when there's only two words in between them because you seem to be saying everyone hearing from the Father is different than all who are taught by God. I just don't assume by a presupposition like you do that people who hear a message automatically have to believe it. I believe that some people can hear a message and choose not to believe it. I believe they can close their ears and their eyes to it. What if verse 45 actually comes after verse 44 and is describing what the, the, the drawing that results in giving of eternal life and resurrection, what if the, all who are taught by God, all who, are, who hear from the Father, all who learn from the Father, is the effective action of God that's provided in Scripture and being described by Jesus. What if that were the, what would that do to your theological understanding of the text? If that were true, then your presupposition, Tulip, would be true. And I don't think your presupposition is true. Mm -hmm. I believe they actually have the responsibility, so, the ability to respond to the teaching of God. So, they can deny it or so, they can accept it. So when I point to, 
All right. So they go on. For, you didn't have anything add. We kind of referenced that before, right? Yeah, we talked about that, and I think I mentioned it that uh, late concedes the debate. If that verse does refer to um, those who uh, like are Same effectively thing. effectively taught, or something like that, or or, or who who are it's a, it's a positive statement, not a statement of potentially they could either reject or accept the teaching that he that he loses the debate. I just don't think that has anything to do with um, whether or not James White's assertions are, are correct. Um, and I've already talked about this, so. Uh, it doesn't Flowers, really in make sense. Yeah. Cross-examination said that if the actions in verse 45, specifically, it is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. Everyone hearing from the Father and learning is coming to me. When he admitted that if those are effective actions by God, specifically teaching, as in revealing who Christ is, and they all, they who are drawn, that's the contextual reading, they who are drawn are taught by God, that's why they are effectively drawn, and they hear, everyone who hears from the Father, everyone who learns from the Father is coming to me. If those are effective actions by God that describe what drawing is, he admitted, that means my position is correct. And then, when I pointed out that his interpretation of this text involves not only ignoring the instrumental uh, mechanism by which the teaching takes place, God is the one doing this, but also ignores the fact that if you are hearing and you are learning, you are passively receiving information into you effectively, and to say that, well, the one is Israel and the, the other is, 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 is others, and I'm simply asking a simple question. The reason it says they shall all be taught of God, and then it says everyone hearing and everyone learning, is the point is this is God's effectual power being demonstrated in the salvation of his people. And his position requires you to draw a line before the, the word pas in the original language and say, this is one group, this is another group, and he can't substantiate that. Did you have anything to add on that? Well, I mean, it's just what I've already said, that, okay, uh, yes, Leighton is probably wrong. Is I think he is wrong there. Um, but even if that is the case, it's still fine for his position. Yep. It doesn't change anything. Um, and, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go over the whole thing all over okay. again. All right. So yeah, uh, Layton talks about babies. Uh, that was this uh, the whole bail gate. That's your thing. You go ahead on bail gate. No, <laughs> no uh, that, I don't know if that's worth mentioning. It was, <laughs> I kind of saw that as like a, a side topic of like, yeah, I, I would like to be, I would be interested to know what exactly Layton was, was thinking when he decided to go that route. Mm -hmm. um, although, you know, I guess certainly if white is true, I think in Layton's eyes, you do have to deal with the consequences of like, hey, if that's a logical outcome, then you you have to, to face that reality, I guess you could say. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So uh, active verbs, um, they mentioned something about active verbs and you can have an active verb that doesn't describe volition. Did you want to go into more detail about that? I actually already talked about it at the beginning, okay. just right, that, so oh, oh, because the verbs are active, so I think this is Layton's point, He's, he cites Brown as well. Uh, I may, Now, I could be charitable and say, oh, he's referring to like what the type of action this verb is describing is something that somebody like has a volition in doing, and that's what he means by active. But if he's referring to grammatical categories, like a active verb, like I hit a baseball, or a passive verb, I am hit by a baseball, um, if it's those, like the active, uh, the vo like, like that, that actually is completely, um, irrelevant to volition. Like that, those are just, um, th th that's not how you do interpretation. That's not how language works. Right. Like I said earlier, you could say he received a punch to the face. That's an active, like active verb. Um, but uh, it's still not has, says nothing about the volition of the person. So whether it's active, passive, middle, that's just a misunderstanding of Greek. Um, how 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 meaning is conveyed in language and how these different grammatical categories really aren't 
uh, going to give you anything in that regard. Gotcha. Uh, I think that probably, I think, the, is it the last thing? Um, yeah, the last thing we could talk quickly about um, White's comment on uh, participles. I think this is actually pretty telling. Side down, and I will just simply, we've already covered all this, but I will just correct one error in uh, Dr. Flowers' closing statement. He tried to identify hearing, uh, the one hearing and, and lear learning. He didn't seem to understand those are participles. They're not finite verbs. Um, and so he was in error about his application at that point. Okay, that's it. Uh, I, f I face palmed within myself when I heard that. Um, now, people who don't know Greek, uh, it's fine. But I would just like to say, oh man, that was actually kind of, I don't want to be mean, but uh, that statement makes no sense. Like it, it is evident that White doesn't seem to quite understand how meaning is conveyed um, and how the ways in which meaning is conveyed in language and in Greek. And uh, like there, I said this at the beginning, there is nothing I can think of next to no situation where if something is a participle, um, that would create a significant exegetical error as compared to if something is a finite verb. Um, but for example, even with the very, the very thing we're talking about, you could use participles. You could say everyone listening from the father and learning participles, just an ing in English, ing, a uh, verbal adjective, really it, it has different functions. You could also say everyone who listens from the, uh, everyone. Yeah. Who listens from the father and learns everyone learns from the father and listens everyone listening from the father and learning. Like there's, there's no difference in meaning um whether if you use a participle or a fine a finite verb uh again to, to make it clear hopefully to people he ate finite verb eating participle i don't know what exegetical error white thinks Leighton um is basing his interpretation on based on assuming a finite over a participle, but I don't think it exists. That's just, I can't even imagine a situation where uh, it would crumble and fall. Interpretation would crumble and fall based on that. So to make that statement, I, it, it, it's, it's inconceivable. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Um, I don't know what he would think could possibly be conveyed that would Leighton's argument would fall apart based on the difference between a finite verb and a participle. But to state that at the end, as though it's some sort of gotcha that you don't know Greek and I, and, and here's why my, the, the grammar really shows your interpretation is wrong. Makes no sense in any way, shape or form. Um, from someone who read knows Greek or even just un understands the basics of language. So, uh, and how 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 you can communicate various things in, in various ways and mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what he was getting at there. I'm not going to try and suppose, but it was pretty telling towards either a misunderstanding of how Greek functions or language functions, or of just like a trying to be a gotcha uh, in a in a really incomprehensible way. So just so just for some clarity, so you're saying yeah. that uh, James. White was possibly like, "Hey, Leighton was wrong with about this. He d doesn't necessarily mean anything, but he was wrong about that, right? Like that seems to be what's happening, unless if he actually thought that there was a difference." Uh, well, I think the White says because it's a participle, mm. therefore Leighton's wrong because he thought it was a finite verb. Mm. That's the argument. Oh, yeah, I don't know what he's trying to imply by that, like to go further. Um, but that, that, that statement in and of itself is nonsensical because you would just wouldn't have an argument stand or fall in this context based on those categories. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So, yeah. uh, uh, James Willison made an interesting point. So, oh, yeah. So, um, so just for, can you clarify what you were doing earlier with Nehemiah nine thirty? So that was that translation where, you were like, uh, Leighton, I don't know exactly where he got this one. This other one that you think it's a much better translation. 
is better. Um, so I don't know. Maybe you got maybe it gave people the impression that you were kind of dismissing what he was saying purely based off that. Could you clarify there? Uh, yeah, uh, I was only dismissing it in the sense of uh, looking at the standard and um, translation for Septuagint, which is Nets, uh, New English translation of the Septuagint. Uh, it doesn't seem like Nehemiah 930 in particular uh, is being used in the sense that Leighton wants. Um, and so I don't know where he got his translation from for Nehemiah 930, but that doesn't seem to be the sense of the word in that specific context. Now, you could say Helco uh, elsewhere is not about some sort of dragging or doesn't convey when it's a person dragging another person or metaphorical dragging or something like that uh, or drawing. Like it doesn't have this aspect of, 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 of a no volition on the part of that which is drawn. Mm -hmm. um, you could make that argument. But in Nehemiah 930, that doesn't seem to be uh, the case or involved because it's not referring. It, it shouldn't be translated as such. Um, that's all I was getting at. Uh, so the and broader basic, point yeah. could still stand, but that specific example didn't make sense. But it seems like you're saying, hey, this other translation, the, the standard Septuagint translation says something different. Therefore, we should mm -hmm. go with that translation. Is that what you're saying? Basically just saying, like, I don't think that's what that verse is saying in the Greek, um, if we're going to go by nets. Um, but maybe, Hey, I'm, I'm open to being persuaded. Otherwise there, sure. Like if, if, if you think you can, if there's a better translation and that's, uh, um, I don't remember who the translator is for, for Nehemiah in, in nets. But, um, if you think that there's a better translation for that specific verse that proves the point, sure. Um, I just, it didn't seem apparent to me that that was the case in this instance. It just, it might've just been like a, a translation on the fly or something like that to try and prove the drawing point. It was a pretty nitpicky kind of thing. So I understand. Uh, if somebody is uh, thinking that I'm trying to dismiss the whole argument, which I'm not, I'm just saying that specific example didn't make sense when I saw it. And I'm a Septuagint guy. So it's like, oh, well, well, is that what the Septuagint says there? Oh, it, it's probably not. Why aren't you going to Jeremiah 31? Jeremiah 31 is probably the intertext here, but you didn't even mention it once. Jeremiah 31 is like, if you go to uh, Nestle Alon, like the Greek, um, uh, version that most a lot of people use like uh, for, for reading, uh, like one of the, the parallel texts it gives you are, are Isaiah 54 and Jeremiah 31 uh, for this section, uh, for, for, for the citation um, in verse uh, 45. And so Jeremiah 31 is on the mind of, of probably of the, uh, of the writer. And so if you're going to use Helco and talk about it, go there. Don't go to a translate to Nehemiah where it might not even mean anything to do with what you're thinking. It could be a more metaphorical or a more distant usage of the term. That's all I'm getting at. Just being precise. Mm, I see. So, well, I guess something really important is that if you're going to be citing other examples of a word, then if there's like a big debate about it, and I mean, clearly there is at least some debate about it. Otherwise, this other translation, you know, the big name translation wouldn't take that view. Then I don't know, maybe a little asterisk in the, asterisk in the corner of the, the slide or something like or Yeah, something. saying I'm taking this as this kind of drawing and not um, how Nets translated it, which was very different. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on here, Dr. Critko. It's been really fun. Uh, I appreciate mm -hmm. your time. Um, everyone, make sure to let us know what you think about this. What did Kuritko get wrong? What did I get wrong? Uh, what did you guys think about the debate? Who? I don't want to ask who won because I don't care about that. But uh, let us know your thoughts in the comments. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for coming on. And uh, otherwise, I hope you have a good rest of your night.